computers within the local network. And the goal is for it to be that simple. Um, and we have this working internally right now. We need, still need to iron out some issues for different security settings for different people's uh, local networks. Um, but th that's, that's basically how the feature should work. So it should be pretty straightforward to run uh, models on multiple computers in your local network. Um, so with that, I'll talk a little bit about Pathfinder and what we are planning for that um, in the next, well, and what we've implemented recently in the most recent release, because uh, we actually just released Pyrus, or Pathfinder 2011 uh, earlier this summer. Um, for those of you not familiar with Pathfinder, Pathfinder, it's our agent-based evacuation model. And unlike Pyrosim, where we've wrapped around a simulator from a, a, another source, we've written all of the code for this one, including the simulation engine. Um, again, it lets you import your geometry simply from either CAD models or from an existing Pyrosim model file and supports high-quality visualization of the res results. Um, our goals for this release, uh, 2011 the release this year, um, were to handle some issues with the original uh, Pathfinder, the most recent release, 2009, um, where in certain, we, we followed a fairly simple model where everybody went to the closest exit. Um, and that was based on our feedback from our, our uh, uh, partners at RJA and from uh, our users, our existing users of Pathfinder 2009. We decided that we needed to sort of improve that a little bit. It's what we called local door selection. Um, also, we wanted to add some additional capabilities to script occupant movement rather than only have the choice of going to the closest exit. Um, and that would allow you to do a variety of different things, you know, whether it's uh, handle uh, first responders entering into a building or to represent uh, refuge floors where maybe uh, some of the occupants go to a certain location in the building and wait for a specified period of time uh, or then exit later. Um, we also had a goal of trying to implement a, a basic elevator model as elevators are becoming more and more relevant in evacuation, particularly for large high-rise buildings. Um, we wanted to get something in there that could be of use uh, today uh, in simulating evacuation scenarios. And we wanted to improve performance. That's always a goal, especially of our programmers. You know, they want to make sure everything runs as fast as possible. Um, and our earlier version uh, only used a single processor on the machine. The current one uses as much power as available in your multi-core computer. Um, with that, I wanted to show a little bit of the way it used to work. This is a, a simple demonstration of a kind of a contrived room, and there are three exits at the bottom here. And you'll notice that probably 90% of the occupants are going through the center exit. Because of the way this geometry has been set up, it's the closest exit to all the occupants in the room. And that was one of the problems we had in the, in the previous release. Um, it was, our goal has always been to try to keep the movement model as simple as possible, because it's much easier to defend and validate and verify in that situation. Um, but there's always these cases, well, Real people handle, behave differently. They have a lot of choices. Um, but it's also quite reasonable to expect that people would, would flow out and use these other doors. So we wanted to address that problem um, so by adding a little bit of additional complexity to deal with going somewhere other than simply the closest door. Um, and that manifested itself in multiple cases. Here's another one where they aren't necessarily the exit doors, but you can see there's two choices here, and everybody's you know, been pre-planned to take this one door because it's the closest, so it backs them up, and it, people don't actually use the full width of the hallway because they're all going through, through a single door. So how did we approach this problem? We uh, came up with, instead of simply the shortest path to the exit, what we call the locally quickest approach. So it's still, uh, we're trying to keep things as simple as we can, but in this case, we, we change the, the global way that people are rooted out of the building from the absolute shortest path to their closest exit to a, a more local approach, where if you're in a particular room, you're going to seek out your closest door to you and then build upon an underlying map of how the, the, the rooms are connected to get out of the building. And what this does is essentially the same thing as shortest path for simple cases. But when you have multiple doors in a room such as this one, um, it can allow people to spread it around. And since they're now using a time-based uh, criteria locally instead of distance, it can allow for balancing of queues to local, local doors. Um, and exactly how we implemented this, we had a lot of different ways to think about. Um, we first started with what we called the local density method. And that's where we were trying to say, OK, well, if you're in a room and there's a queue of people over there, 
you know that the, there's a more dense population, so you're going to slow down as you head that way, and you kind of estimate, that's going to take me 10 seconds to get to that door, but only two seconds to get to this door, so I'm going to pick this door. Um, which made a lot of sense and worked, um, but it, it required us to calculate the real-time density um, of all the, the distribution of people in, in every room uh, to work through that, to get, go from density of, to velocity and from velocity to time. Um, have kind of a little picture of that here in what we have, just a simple test case where we have a set of turnstiles here, basically. And, and in, again, in the old version, most of these people would have a closest exit up here, so they would all sort of line up and try to go into one little exit here. Um, but to make this work, we were calculating in real time, we have to divide up the space and figure out how much area is associated with each person. Uh, in the mathematical computer science world, you can do that with what's called a Voronoi diagram. So you, you divide up space, so in real time, we're triangulating these people and coming up with polygons that basically represent the personal space of each person. And that lets us create a map of, if we can take you know, people divided by area and get a, get a density map for that whole room. So we can, uh, if I can trigger this video here. It's just kind of fun to see this run in real time. As people spread out the the area that's associated with them gets larger and smaller. And we made this approach work, and it worked reasonably well for, for dividing up these people so that they could choose better which exit they should use. Um, and you can see as they flow out, the areas assigned to each person gets larger. Um, but in the end, we, we threw this one away because it took more time to implement because um, we have to calculate these areas in real time as the simulation is going on. Um, and it had other problems in that it, we support multiple movement models in Pathfinder. In addition to our agent-based evacuation that's our primary model, um, we have a mode in there that lets you try to recreate the SFPE hand calculations. And in that mode, um, the density approach kind of falls apart because the SFPE hand calcs is kind of a, a cruder set of assumptions and we don't really track where people are in a room at any given time. It just tracks how long it takes people to get across rooms and through doors. So the way our model works, it would have you know, 100 people waiting in a line in an infinitely small amount of space next to a door. Well, that would send our density calculation through the roof, and it wouldn't, we couldn't use the same concept for both our SFPE model and our agent model. So we switched over to using the idea of a queue size and estimating, OK, I see there's 10 people in line for that door, and instead of saying, you know, estimating my velocity to get to that space, I'm going to say, well, it takes me a certain time to get to that door, which I've labeled here as, as T1, so that's my time to get across the room. But then I also recognize that there are 30 people waiting for that door. And if it's, say, only a, you know, three-foot wide door, we use, you know, the basic SFPE assumptions of how many people per second per uh, unit of effective width we have to estimate how long it will take for that queue to clear the door. So whichever time is greater, that 20 seconds it takes me to get the door, or let's say it takes 30 seconds for that queue to get through, I know it's going to take me 30 seconds to get through that door. And I evaluate that for all doors in my space, and then I can choose based on that measure instead. And it turns out this approach uh, was both faster to implement in the code and worked better for all of our cases and helped us uh, it, use it for both our agent-based mode and our SFPE-based mode. So if we now go back and look at the same videos again, you'll see with the new model that people are distributing out um, across all three doors. And I didn't note the time on the other one, but the, the total time is quite a bit shorter now because we're using all of the effective exits. And we see the same thing on this one, too, in that now they're using both exits equally. And you'll even see a few people move up when the queue gets a little long and they decide uh, that it would be faster to go to the other door. And this even had benefits. Um, this is just an idea of showing how that affected balancing of even a room. Here's a, a space with one tiny exit up here, you know, only maybe one unit of width and three or four units of width over here. And in the old version, you know, half the people use one and half use the other. And in the new one, they're estimating based on a time. And at some point, some of these people think, hey, it'll, I'll get out this door quicker, even though I have to walk across the room. Whoops. Too many. So in addition to locally quickest, one of our other uh, release goals for the 2011 version was to support scripting. Um, as I said, in the original or the 2009 version of Pathfinder, everybody basically had a single behavior in the model, which was to seek out the closest exit. Um, in 
Pathfinder 2011, we have a capability to set up a set of what are called behaviors, which control, it's still very simple, but you can tell uh, any given occupant or set of occupants to travel to a certain area or location. Uh, you can tell them to, to wait or move on. And then you can also select what exit or set of exits they may use at the end of the simulation. And you can combine all those in any way you want. And that now gives you flexibility to do many things. Like in this particular simple case, we have uh, a single occupant, and this, this room is going to be filled with people, but this single occupant is being told to go to a particular point, wait for 20 seconds, and then proceed to any exit in the model. And if we see that run, and this could represent a first responder, for instance, or a person looking for a family member, they work their way with counterflow. Whoops, wrong button. Sorry about that. Too many models here. They work their way against the flow, she'll wait for 20 seconds, and then seek out the exit. And that allows also to, to represent areas of refuge or basically about anything you want, it, with, a, again, still a very simple model. Um, in addition to the scripting, we worked a lot on performance, um, I said, and then also a basic elevator model. Um, I didn't put together a lot of information on the elevator model, but we have it uh, online in our in our uh, technical manual for the simulator. But basically, again, we, we've followed the philosophy of trying to keep things simple. And we've set up a system based on the, the current uh, working uh, thoughts of um, the experts on how we should be using elevators and evacuations um, to implement a way to incorporate them into the simulator, but with basically as simple a model as possible. And basically, the requirements are that in an evacuation mode, typically, the elevators will you know, return to the lobby area. But then the, the, to use them for evacuation, the current thinking is that they'll return to, say, the, the floor with an incident, the fire floor, and evacuate that entire floor, and then uh, sequence the other floors in the building, you know, either a, a floor or two above or below the incident floor. And then if the, the local commander desires, finish evacuating the entire building from the top down. So we need a way to determine what order in which floors are going to be cleared and how long it takes to fill an elevator and for it to travel from the ground floor up to any given floor and back. So with that basic set of inputs, we've put together an elevator model um, that basically requires you to simply input you know, elevator sizes and travel times. And then you can sequence them and set up a, a particular case. And here's one. This is just a snapshot at the very beginning of a, a, just a test model that basically just shows a bunch of full elevator lobbies with two elevators. And in this case, there's an incident on the, I can't believe, the, I believe it's the second or third floor. And the elevators are going to, they've been set to a certain priority queue, basically. They're going to clear out that floor and then above and below and then finish the rest of the model. Um, and this just sort of shows a demonstration that that's working. And this is all in the current 2011 release of Pathfinder. I don't think it's playing that one, Brian. I guess that counts for our first technical difficulty of the day. Looks like the floors are moving, but you can't see it on your screen. Oh, there it goes. So it's, here it's cleared the first floor, now it's going a floor below. And it'll have to make multiple trips to, to get the whole set of people. And everything that, we've, that I've mentioned so far kind of culminated in letting, allowing us to implement the elevators, because the people are also choosing based on that locally quickest approach which elevator on their floor to line up at. Um, and the scripting also under the hood is used for helping control how people move through the model. So all of these things we worked at for this current release kind of culminated in uh, being able to, to implement this elevator model in Pathfinder. And the final thing we had, I mentioned a little bit performance. Um, our developers are pretty proud of it. Now, most models are anywhere from two to four times faster on a dual core or quad core machine. Um, because now we've, we've done quite a bit of different things to speed things up. Um, we've, the, that locally quist, quickest approach we used, in, in addition to giving us more realistic results, also helped uh, reduce calculation time by quite a bit. And uh, you see in this model, we're actually, this model runs uh, fairly quickly. I can't remember how long it takes to, to simulate. But this was several thousand occupants in a, in a theater space. Um, but anyway, it's all quite a bit faster now, too. So we're hopefully making progress on all fronts with, uh, with our development. And with that, I think I've uh, used 
just about all of my time. So. Do we have any questions? In the back, one moment. Brian, um, what's the difference between running uh, parallel sim in uh, parallel mode compared to clusters? Excuse me, the difference between running in parallel parallel in uh, parallel mode compared to uh, running in clusters. Oh, okay, in the run cluster. When you when in Pyrosim, when you choose the run parallel option, it launches multiple processes, but only on your own computer. So if you have a dual core or quad core computer, it can run as many grids as you have processors on your own computer. The cluster option lets you pull in additional computers on the network, um, which can help for very large problems, particularly. Um, if you have a 10 million cell problem that may require 10 gigabytes of RAM and you don't have that much in your computer, you can break it up into eight grids, for instance, and run two grids on each of four computers, and maybe then each one only needs two or three gigabytes on each individual machine. So I need to install Parosim in all computers? No, you only need to install this little module that we'll be distributing as an option with Pyrosim. And it's not the full Pyrosim user interface. It's just a client for the FDS clustering uh, feature. So it'll be a lightweight thing that you can install. And the, the FDS executables will end up on that machine during the, pro during the problem run. All right, thank you. Yes? Uh, have you also benchmarked the uh, parallelization you get in the uh, running on a cluster? What kind of parallelization can we expect? Um, it's hard to answer that question. Yeah, I it mean, depends it, it depends a lot on the kind of hardware you have. And you do pay a penalty running on multi -compu multiple computers connected over a network as opposed to in a single machine. Um, for, for moderate and small problems, it's, it's almost always better just to run them on a single machine or on server hardware, for instance, where you might have two, two dual-core chips in a single box, um, you can actually run a pretty large problem on a machine like that. But when you go beyond, it's more, in my view, more necessitated, necessitated by problem size than simply by, by speed. Yeah. Um, so it really varies on the type of problem and how you incorporate your machines together. You, you don't add two computers on your network and get it to run in half the time. Thank you. Other questions? Uh, yeah, uh, great presentation. Uh, just a quick question in terms of meshes. Can you actually nominate which node a particular mesh will run on? Um, our current internal option does not have that sort of affinity set yet, but that's certainly the kind of feedback that we can use during the beta development cycle. I can see where you might want to put a large mesh on a more powerful computer and smaller meshes on, on less powerful computers. Yeah, or in, in cases, for example, where we have some meshes that have a, a larger number of cells than, than smaller right. meshes, so we can balance. Yeah, I believe the current system we have simply goes through them in order, in the same order in the grid list as, they, as the computer list. But we can make that more flexible, I believe. Great. All right. All right. I think we need to get moving on to the next speaker. So. OK. Thank you very much. <laughs>